Good morning. In a few minutes, I'm going to tell you a story. It's an incredible story about God answering prayer. <laughs> and I, I've been waiting all week to, to tell you this story. But before we jump into our message, let's begin with a word of prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, How grateful I am for this moment. It's a holy moment. It's a time that we get to come together and seek your face. And so, Father, I pray that as we spend a few moments here today, whether it be here on Sunday morning or another day, another time of day, that someone is joining in just to stay current with where we are as a church. May that moment accomplish everything you desire. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we begin our time today, I have a question. And the question is this. Have you ever been so desperate that you did something absolutely crazy because the reward was worth the risk. Some of you right now perhaps are thinking of a moment, and that moment, it was awesome. Either you swallowed a goldfish or ate a worm or did something absolutely crazy in college with some of your best friends just because you were bored one night with nothing better to do. The laughter, the attention, or the girl you kissed was worth the crazy moment of desperation you endured. So let me ask the question again. How desperate are you for God to do something great in your life? That's the question I believe God has for us today. Like there's this story in the Bible of a man who couldn't walk. He had four friends. I would love to have four friends like this guy. They cared so much for their friend, and they were so desperate for God to do something for him that they carried him to Jesus. But there was a problem. When they got to the place where Jesus was, the crowd was so large that there was no more room in the building. And first of all, let me just say, how cool would that be, right? But that didn't stop them. You see, they were so desperate for their friend that they carried him to the roof and they cut a hole in that roof. Can you imagine that? They didn't get permission. Nope, but they were so desperate that they did whatever was necessary to get their friend in front of Jesus. I love that story. And that day, their friend was healed. Who would like friends like that? Come on, I'll take some whatever it takes kind of friends who will go the extra mile, who will go whatever length is necessary to experience a miracle from God. Is anyone in the room like me? Reminds me of a story. A student at Montana State University was so desperate uh, to win the lottery that she prayed to God one day and asked Him to help her win. And the next morning she woke up, she didn't win. <laughs> so she prayed to God again, asking to win the lottery. And she reasoned with God that she'll use the money to do a lot of good and cure all diseases in the world. The next morning she woke up, she didn't win. So she prayed to God again and asked Please, God, help me win the lottery. She reasoned that she'd use a, uh, the money to, to uh, uh, produce a lot of good and feed the hungry children in the world. The next morning, she woke up and she didn't win. And finally, out of frustration, she shouted at the sky, Why won't you let me win the lottery and do good for the world? Huh. Suddenly, the cloud spread apart and God said to her, I'm trying to help you here, but you have to buy a ticket desperation. That's a different kind of desperation, but I want to welcome you to our series today, brand new series that we're started, starting the Circle Maker. <clears throat> it's a series on prayer, and it's so appropriate because as your pastor, I want you to know I'm desperate. In fact, just say these words out loud, no matter if you're alone or with someone else in the room, our pastor is desperate because it's absolutely true. I am I'm desperate. 
Today, I hope at the end of the service, you'll be desperate too, just like me, for God to do something so incredible, so great, that the only explanation, the only way you could explain or reason what just took place is that God did that. And here's what I believe. God wants people who want God to do something like that. Let me say it one more time. God wants people who want God to do something like that. I'm encouraging you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. And we're going to read, as Jesus teaches his disciples, a lesson on prayer. Jesus is the teacher. He's the professor. The disciples are the students. And Jesus is going to teach a lesson. Let's read. Once Jesus was in a certain place praying, as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. But then he goes on. He said, it says, teaching them more about prayer, he used the story. I love the story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight, wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, Don't bother me. The door's locked for the night, and my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for the friend's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. Say those two words. Shameless persistence. Say them out loud. Shameless persistence persistence. And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? This is probably my favorite teaching on prayer in the Bible. And I'm going to go a little deeper, beginning with verse 5. Just some observations based on what we just read. There's this guy, and he's desperate. Do you see it? It's late. And guests arrive at his home, and he has nothing for them. And so he goes to his friend's house, who's a neighbor, and he rings the doorbell. He stands there and keeps ringing it. Ring, 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 ring. Have you ever done that? <laughs> you know their home but they're not coming to the door. And so you keep ringing. And finally, <laughs> the owner comes. And he's not exactly happy to see you. In fact, he's quite frustrated. It's there, and Jesus is giving you permission. Notice this. Jesus is giving you permission to keep ringing the doorbell. He's telling you to keep asking until you get what you're asking for. These aren't my words. This is the words of Jesus teaching us how to pray. Jesus teaches in the story that because of the man's shameless persistence, did you see those words? He finally gets 
wants, what he wants. I love this. Jesus tells you to keep asking, to keep praying, to keep coming back over and over and over until you get what you're asking for. And so here's the question I have for you. Do you have that kind of shameless persistence? How easily do you give up asking God to answer your prayers? This series is influenced by a book titled The Circle Maker. And I was reminded of that book a couple of weeks ago, and that conversation was exactly what I needed to hear. That was a God moment. That day, God spoke to me through a friend that I'm eager to spend more time with. And I believe this with all my heart. God was saying to me, pay attention. Pay attention. You need to be reminded of something. I have a word for you. And what I needed to hear that day, I would suggest that you need to hear this morning. Listen, God is not offended by bold prayers. He is offended by anything less. God honors bold prayers, church, because bold prayers honor God. I have a story I've been waiting all week to tell you. (laughs) It's from the Book of Legends, which is a collection of stories from the Jewish Talmud, and it contains teachings of Jesus' rabbis that they pass down from generation to generation. The Book of Legends contains more than a thousand years' worth of wisdom. And in that book, you'll find the story of a man named Hani, H-O-N-I, Hani the Circle Maker. It took place in 1st century BC after a devastated drought threatened to destroy the entire generation before Jesus. The last of the Jewish prophets had died off nearly four centuries before. It's been 400 years since God spoke. And miracles had become a distant memory and it seemed like God was nowhere to be found and nowhere to be heard. (laughs) But there was a man. (laughs) But there was a man. I want to be that kind of man. There was a man, an old sage, who lived outside the walls of Jerusalem who dared to pray anyway. His name was Hani, and even if the people could not hear God, he believed that God could still hear them. Famous for his ability to pray for rain, the people pleaded with Hani to pray for a miracle. And so with the six-foot staff in his hand, Hani began to turn right where he was standing like a map compass, and he never looked up as the crowd looked on. And when he was done returning, Hani stood inside the circle he had just drawn. And then he dropped to his knees and raised his hands to heaven. And with the authority of the, of the prophet Elijah, who called down fire from heaven, Honi called down rain. He prayed, Lord of the universe, listen to this prayer. I swear before your great name that I will not move from this circle until you have shown mercy upon your children. The words that he prayed sent a shudder down the spine of all who were within earshot that day. Did you hear his prayer? He said he would not move until God answered his prayer. Let's continue, but let's learn a lesson. Because it happened. As his prayer ascended to the heavens, raindrops descended to the earth. And the people rejoiced over each raindrop, but Honey wasn't satisfied with the sprinkle. He lifted his voice over the sounds of celebration and prayed these words, Not for such rain have I prayed, but for rain that that will fill cisterns, pits, and caverns. And the sprinkle turned into a torrential downpour that the people had to flee to the temple. But he still wasn't satisfied. Not for such rain have I prayed, but for the rain of thy favor, blessing, and graciousness. And the downpour turned into a perfectly proportioned sun shower, each raindrop a tangible token of God's grace. What's interesting is that Honey was almost excommunicated for his prayer. 
because some members of the Sanhedrin believed that it was too bold. I'm going to say it again. God is not offended by bold prayers. When an audacious dream stirs our hearts and we seek God for direction and wisdom, and then when that dream becomes clear, God is honored when we pray for him to work on our behalf. The story of Honey drawing a circle and then clearly communicating his desire to God is a wonderful gift. It shows you and I what happens when we pray through a dream that God has planted deep in our hearts. And then the lesson that Jesus teaches in Luke 11 is almost God saying, I dare you. At least that's how I read it. It's, in fact, it's really so much more than a simple dare. It's actually a triple dog dare. When and what are you desperate for? So desperate, church, that you'll keep knocking at the door. You'll keep asking your heavenly father who loves you and he desires to give good gifts to his children to ask. Will you be diligent? Will you be persistent? With shameless persistence, will you keep asking? Because it matters. Have you ever wanted something? And it was all you could think about. And that dream would keep you awake at night. And your mind, it goes there often throughout the day. I mean, you think about it more than, you think about it more than ice cream. Nothing else mattered. Anyone in the room? Spiritually speaking, we should never be content. We should never be satisfied. We should never get to a place where we have seen enough. You know what I mean? Have you ever had a parent or a teacher say, I've seen enough. <laughs> You've pushed them to the limit and what happens next, you won't like. That's not a good place to be. Church, it's never a good place to be when You've seen enough from God. No one is going to say those words or tell God that. That would be absolutely crazy. But you know that actions speak louder than words. And so what are your actions saying about what you believe? If you aren't praying for God to do something great, something that only he can do, your actions might be telling God you've seen enough that you're satisfied with what he's done. If you aren't pursuing something right now that is too great for you to accomplish, your actions are saying what you believe, and even worse, what you don't believe about God. So what are you hoping for? What holy expectations do you have from a God for whom nothing is impossible? Is there a situation, an insurmountable problem that feels so ominous, it's like, staring at the Bitterroot Mountains and they're just glaring back at you and you've prayed and prayed and maybe you've just stopped praying because God doesn't seem to listen and maybe you think he doesn't seem to care. If that's you, well, in a way you're telling God, I've seen enough. I want to encourage this, you this morning to draw a circle and keep on praying. Let me share a few words from Mark Patterson. Nothing is more important or more powerful than prayer. It is the difference between you fighting for God and God fighting for you. It is the difference between the possible and the impossible. It is the difference between intimacy and ignorance. It is the difference between fear and and faith between success and failure. It is the difference between the best you can do and the best God can do. And there is a big difference between those two things. End of quote. Because the person, church, who hasn't seen enough from God, well, that person keeps on praying. They continue to ask they keep seeking for God to do something incredible, and they ask the God for whom nothing is impossible to show off and do something that will be just one more sign to your friends 
that don't believe in God that maybe, just maybe he might be real and maybe it's time to see what this Jesus is all about. This morning I'm going to give you three things, just three simple things as we end our time here together that I'm suggesting you do for the next few weeks. The first is this, pray about what to pray about. Pray about what to pray about. I think some of us just pray the first thing that comes to mind. And then we pull from cliches that we've heard at church or other places. And honestly, it's empty. It's empty because they aren't personal. And when they aren't personal, they aren't powerful. You see, in Luke 11, the man who is harassing his friend, his neighbor for food is doing so because it was personal to him. He has hungry people in his house that need food. So if I may... I'm encouraging you to begin by praying and asking God what we should pray about. And then combine those prayers with Scripture. When a promise in the Bible captures your attention and you think and spend time and you meditate upon it, ask God if this is what you are to pray about. There is a difference between I hope this or I wish that and saying there is a promise in Scripture that I'm circling in prayer and I'm staking claim to the promise of the Word of God. Then you can have a holy confidence because it's God's Word, and God's Word doesn't return void. That's what I'm talking about. We need to pray about what to pray about. It's not your agenda for God. It's about getting God's agenda for God. Notice the difference. Number two. Write down what you're praying about. A couple weeks ago, I shared with you this principle about journaling, that the shortest pencil is longer than the longest memory. When you write it down, you will remember it. It's like honey drawing a circle. When God gives you a word, a phrase, a dream, or a promise, because it's from Him, it's significant. Write it down so you don't forget it. And then circle. Draw a circle and say, here is what I'm praying for, because here is what I believe God has has positioned me for, to seek Him until He provides the answer. And then number three, pray like it depends on God, but work like it depends on you. That is a wonderful phrase. Pray like it depends on God, because that is how we should pray. But work as if it depends on you, because we need skin in the game as well. I've been obsessed about praying for our future. It's on my mind every day. And so I've been praying and asking God for a miracle, because church, that's what we need. To be able to grow, we need more space, and in order for us to have more space, We need more finances. So God and I have been talking. (laughs) We've been spending time together. And I've had some shameless persistence, church. But I've also had lots of conversations with people. I'm asking people, friends I know, people who, who, when they pray, things happen. I've asked people to pray for who we are as a church and the direction that we are going. And I'm also asking people to pray, especially those that have the capacity, to pray how they might give. You see, I'm not content with the church that we are today. We've seen some very exciting things the past couple of months. Don't dwell on those answers to prayer, because that's what they are. Thank God for them. But get new prayers to pray. Do you see the difference? And then pray like it depends on God, but work like it depends on you. We've seen some marvelous things the past few months. And they certainly have stirred my soul and they've reminded me, they've been a great reminder that God is on our side, that He is for us. And I thank God for them. But the danger would be to dwell on them, to to continually think about them and allow those experiences to satisfy your desire for what God could potentially do. And I'm not going to do that. I'm going to thank, but I'm going to ask God for more things to pray for. What new prayers do you want me to pray, God? What new dreams do you want me to dream about? 
What new things do you desire to do among us? And I'm going to seek you. I'm going to draw a circle. And I'm going to stay in that circle in my mind and continue to pray with shameless persistence. I want you to write down a date. The date is June 4th. It's exactly 28 days from today. On that day, we will gather together as a church like we normally do. But after church, we're going to have a meeting. And in that meeting, uh, we're, we're going to have some lunch. And after lunch, we're going we're gonna to talk about, we're going to have a meeting about who we are as a church and the direction that I believe, and, and I believe you believe this, that God is calling us to, June 4th. And I'm asking that you join me in the next couple of weeks, the next 28 days, for that day. And that you do the three things I've asked. And I believe God is asking from us. God, what should we pray about? And then when he answers that prayer, write it down. And then pray as if it all depends on God, but work as if it all depends on you. I'm very excited. I have great anticipation in my heart for how God is going to answer our prayers and how God is going to show up and show off and do something great and significant once again for us as a church. And I hope that you will be a circle maker like me. Join me in that. And let's see what God can do with a church that seeks him with shameless persistence. Let's pray. Father, my heart is very encouraged. I have great anticipation, great expectation for the days ahead. And I love it when, in a sense, we're kind of backed into a corner, and that's kind of how I feel right now. That there are certainly some challenges that we have as a church. But here's what I know about you. They don't intimidate you. And I think, to a certain extent, you're looking down upon us as a people and you're saying, okay, what are they going to do now? Are they going to try to figure out the answers on their own? Or are they going to seek me? And so, Father, these next couple of weeks as we pray about what to pray about, I pray that you would clearly lay it upon each one of our hearts, those that draw a circle and say, okay, God, I'm all in. What should I pray about? And as you answer that prayer, may we be diligent in writing it down. Because when we've heard from you, that's an important thing to remember. And then with shameless persistence, Father God, I pray that we would pray like it depends on you, but do our part as well and work as if it depends on us. And in doing those things, we are setting ourselves up for you to show up and do something that can only be explained that God did this. That's my prayer. That is my desire. And that's the circle I've drawn. And I have holy anticipation for how you're going to answer those prayers. Thank you for your blessing so far. We're very, very grateful for it. But I've not seen enough. Show me more of your glory. Amen. Thank you so much for joining in. And if you're going to join us for these next 28 days, and I would just encourage you to, to uh, drop me a note, either in uh, Facebook or, or email or text or phone call or whatever it might be, and just say, you know what, I'm all in, I'm drawing circles. And let's see what God will do with us and through us and in us. Thanks so much for joining in and for allowing me to have this time with you today. 
Have a wonderful day.